Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Dr. Daria B.T. Henry. I am the interim director of the Multicultural Center. Uh, I've been at, with Bristol for three years as the director of TRIO, and I actually started out my college career with the former director, Rob Delalu. We started out at Dean College together when we were both 18 years old. So when I got the opportunity to serve as an interim director, I had a conversation with my good friend, and I felt good that I could step in and continue some of the great work that he started with all of you. I also want to take the time to thank Melissa Rogers, our special programs coordinator, who's been working with all of you throughout her time here and helped put this event together. On behalf of the department, we are excited to have you with us today. Uh, this keynote marks the 12th social justice event in, at Bristol and the first in-person event in this series uh, since we've been offering it. Through our social justice series, we aim to bring awareness to social inequalities that exist in our communities and create positive change through influencing actionable solutions to the barriers that exist for marginalized groups. Today's discussion is in honor of National Coming Out Day, which is celebrated every year on October 11th to mark this anniversary of the National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights in 1979, the year after I was born. Right. This day is meant to celebrate the act of coming out when an LGBTQ plus person decides to publicly share their gender identities or sexual orientation. Before we begin, uh, or as we continue, I want to introduce our president, Aime, that's going to come in and give you a little bit about herself and introduce our speaker. So, thank y'all. Hi, I'm Aime. Uh, most of you know me. Or if not, I'm Aime. Um, I'm the president of the LGBTQ Plus Heroes Club here at Bristol. Also sometimes referred to as HERO. Uh, HERO, or HEROES, uh, stands for Helping Educate Regarding Orientation and Engaging Students. Um, we are a club that's run out of the multicultural sector, and um, the club is here to be a safe, judgment-free space for where people can express themselves freely and connect with people who are like them. Um, I'm excited today to uh, welcome Emerson Rothwell, who will be leading today's discussion. Emerson Rothwell is a multiracial, white-presenting, queer, trans, and neurodivergent therapist and clinical consultant who has been working in the mental health field for over 14 years. Emerson specializes in providing inclusive therapy to, to LGBTQ plus, LGBTQIA plus individuals and does their work through an anti-racist, social justice, trauma-informed, and neurodivergent affirming lens. Emerson received a BA in anthropology and psychology in 2005 from Yuma, 2005 from UMass Anne Amherst and an MSW in 2011 from Bridgewater State University. Emerson's work and uh, experience ranges from working in therapeutic residential programs for adolescents to provide, or to provide individual and group therapy in clinic and school settings to now doing individual therapy via telehealth. Emerson has experience providing leadership to a, to a community mental health agency, diversity council, and training mental health and medical providers on LGBTQIA plus affirmative care. We are so happy to have Emerson here with us today. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Hello, I'm Emerson. It's nice to see everyone. Um, my pronouns are they and he, uh, which for me means that you can use they or he, either one interchangeably, and I'm comfortable with any of those combinations. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today um, about National Coming Out Day or the reason for it, um, and also a little bit about what it's like being um, LGBTQIA plus in America today, um, the importance of National Coming Out Day and visibility, um, and then we can talk a little bit about allyship and what that would look like. Also, if anyone has any questions while I go, you can feel free to stop me. Um, okay, so 
the impact of LGBTQIA plus experiences on mental health. Basically, um, because LGBTQIA plus people, I'm also gonna use the term queer um, interchangeably, uh, because they experience higher levels of things like minority stress, um, oppression and discrimination, um, violence, abuse, um, hate crimes. They also experience higher populations of things like substance abuse, um, rates of anxiety and depression, uh, suicide attempts, uh, suicidal ideation, and then also uh, financial and food insecurity, and then they're at greater risk of being um, unsheltered or unhoused. So heterosexism, cisgenderism, and sexual and gender stigma. Um, these are basically the systemic explanations of what uh, the oppression that LGBTQIA plus people face. Um, heterosexism and cisgenderism are both social constructs um, that assume being heterosexual and cisgender are the norm. Um, you see a lot of uh, cisgenderism, especially in the medical settings, and I'll we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then uh, sexual and gender stigma is a form of social stigma um, placed on LGBTQIA plus individuals that comes out in many different ways. Sometimes it's um, moreover, like knowing that you're going into a hostile environment, and sometimes it is not as obvious, but maybe knowing that um, people have less than positive views of queer people. And the minority stress model. So um, when you look this up uh, and read about the minority stress model, it's, they always say it's Mayer's minority stress model, but he actually didn't um, coin the term. It was coined by Dr. Virginia Brooks, um, in the 80s first, and then Meyer did more research and then took the term and said it was his. So that's just a note on that. Um, it, what this basically says is that because LGBTQIA plus people experience so much um, you know, oppression and discrimination, stigma, that they have a higher rate of um, adverse health outcomes because of it. And then there's a list of stressors that exacerbate some of that, um, some of them are more obvious, like, um, you know, like outward uh, abuse, um, you know, discrimination that they face when they go out in public, and some of it is more like internalized um, homo negativity and um, trans negativity. So, the importance of intersectionality for this. Um, I know in social just, justice forums um, in the past, uh, intersectionality is brought up a lot. Um, and this is obviously more of the same. So it's important because it not acknowledges the complexities of people's identities, um, which means that it also acknowledges the complexities of things like oppression and discrimination that people may face. Um, it encourages the understanding that if you're doing um, queer advocacy work, it has to include work um, to challenge other oppressive systems, so like racism, things like that. And it also prioritizes those most affected by systemic oppression and discrimination. And just a note at the bottom that it's uh, assuming everyone's affected the same by things um, because of one of their identities can be dangerous. For example, um, within the que queer community, uh, there can be and is um, racism present. Excuse me. Um, and there's also um, transphobia can exist too. So just because um, we're all part of you know this community and this group doesn't mean that people are free from dealing with other kinds of oppression within that community. So this survey, this is just highlighting more of the intersectionality piece. Um, they did this survey. I know that 6,000 
doesn't seem like a huge number, but I think um, when you're dealing with, so they, they surveyed trans people, and uh, a couple of things when they do research on trans people, one, there's not a lot of research. There's probably more in the past few years than there has been in the past. Um, uh, and it's also not safe to come out necessarily, especially when you think about the researchers, they're probably um, cishet folks that are coming and they want to learn about trans people and they're asking you all of these questions and uh, you don't know if you can trust them or not. So no one's really running and lining up to you know, fill out these things. So 6,000 is actually good uh, for this. Um, so they asked all of these people um, about their experiences of discrimination kind of across their lifespan. So that's in, in pretty much anywhere. So schools, work, um, in their community, in uh, health settings. Um, and they basically found that uh, trans people experience uh, a very high amount of discrimination. Um, and those most impacted are actually um, black trans folks and especially black trans women. And then if you want to see all the data um, or see you know, their results and kind of what they're doing with the information, if you go to um, the taskforce.org, you can search for injustice at every turn and it'll pop up. I will also share these so you don't have to take notes or anything like that. Um, Okay, LGBTQA plus health disparities. This is more just on that, you know, minority stress model. Um, it's talking about um, things that LGBTQIA plus people face, and these are some of them. So less likely to have health insurance, um, less likely to um, go to the doctor when they need to, more likely to... Uh, utilize emergency departments. And the reason why that's something to note is because usually when someone's using an emergency department, that's probably their last, you know, that's their last thing, basically. So it has gotten to a point where it is now an emergency and they need to utilize the service. Um, they're more likely to have a mental health disorder, more likely to take medication for a mental health disorder. Um, they also experience higher rates of HIV and experience higher suicide and attempted suicide rates. Um, and again, noting the intersectionality piece, these stats are higher for trans people of color and especially um, black trans women. And this is talking about so mental health disparities. Um, Basically, they have shown that, again, LGBTQIA plus people experience something like, um, it's usually like two times the rate um, than like cishet folks for uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual um, folks, also pansexual, so the uh, sexual historically marginalized group piece. Um, and then usually transgender adults were something like four times that amount, so it's doubled even for um, the LGB group. Um, LGB youth, again, it, it looks pretty much the same. So they're twice as likely to experience symptoms of depression, active suicidal ideation. Nope, I'm reading the wrong line. So that's trans youth are twice as likely um, and to attempt suicide. And the attempted suicide rate is highest in trans youth than any of these other groups. And again, in trans youth of color. 41% um, of transgender adults have attempted suicide in their lifetime versus less than 2% of the general population. And then uh, both LGB adults and trans adults are more likely to experience um, substance use issues. And this is speaking about, so anti-LGBTQA plus uh, legislation is probably at an all-time high for this year. I mean, usually there are a few things that'll pop up. Um, 
you know, having to do with like marriage rights, adoption rights, and things like that. Um, but lately, there has been kind of like uh, this targeting of the trans community to use for political pawns, essentially, is what's happening. Um, so I think that there have been like 165 or more than 165 um, bills that are brought forward just this year um, that affect uh, transgender people, their medical rights, um, bathroom, uh, where they can play sports, and things like that. Um, and then here's just more examples of legislation that would affect the LGBT community. So some of the ones I talked about, and then also um, uh, barriers to fostering adoption, um, non-discrimination protections, uh, including queer people or not, um, and then sex work uh, decriminalization as well will affect the LGBTQIA plus community. And these are stats. So this slide and the next one are um, stats on violence against the LGBT community. Um, they're pretty dismal, I'm not gonna lie. Um, so basically, so the FBI has this annual hate crime report that they put out every year. Um, the latest one was 2019, and on that report, um, they found that they were like almost 1,400 um, hate crimes reported um, motivated by someone's sexual orientation and also 224 motivated by gender identity. 22% uh, of hate crimes reported by post-secondary institutions in the same year um, were motivated by sexual orientation. And then I think um, of that, all of the um, data that they found for post-secondary uh, institutions, I think 50% were motivated by race as well. Um, and then the FBI has found over the years there's been this shift from, uh, you know, damage to personal items, or yeah, from damage to personal items to um, physical uh, assaults and things like that. And at the bottom you see some of these stats. Um, according to the Association of American Universities, also 2009, uh, 2019, their um, climate survey. They found that 65% of their uh, trans students um, experienced sexual harassment on campus. 21% um, reported uh, intimate partner violence. 15% re reported experiencing some kind of stalking, whether it's online or in person. Um, and then 23% reported unwanted sexual contact. So, those stats are, um, I know that you're not seeing the comparison, but um, when they did all of this data collection, they found that um, the numbers for trans folks were a little higher than they were for um, the women that they also surveyed, and those were also pretty high numbers. So it was women and trans folks that they found. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that's probably counted. <clears throat> yeah, and I think a lot of the times people might not, uh, there's that, you know, the, the surgery question. Have you had the surgery? Are you going to have, you know, this? Um, and for some reason, I think some people don't realize that they're asking about your genitals, which is kind of not, um, hello, nice to meet you, a question that you ask as soon as you're, you know, meeting someone new. Um, but yes, that would definitely count as unwanted sexual questions at the very least. And something too about this, the intimate partner violence, um, there is a power and control wheel that's used for um, people who experience intimate partner violence. And normally it's just uh, a wheel and it talks about the different ways that um, 
an abuser would be uh, controlling or abusive, um, and it kind of splits it up into different um, groups. And there's actually a different one for LGBTQIA plus people, and it also includes things that I don't know that people would really think about, and, and part of it is um, like manipulation, uh, threatening to out someone, either to their family, their community, their job, um, and that's for LGBT, LGB people and trans folks as well. And then uh, specifically for trans people, um, there's also the fact that they could, um, if they're on like something like HRT or on some medication or gender affirming medication, things like that, they could either throw them away or hide them from them. So that's also one of the, um, the forms of abuse that they had found. Um, this is specific violence against trans people. Um, and a note about this is that the Human Rights Campaign does this report every year. If you go to their um, website, it's at the bottom, hrc.org, they actually list the names of all the victims to make sure that they're not um, you know, forgotten. Um, but they've been doing this since 2018-ish uh, you know, is when I started putting them in my trainings like this, and I remember thinking in, in 2018 that 26 was a, a pretty large number, and then, you know, watched it through the years kind of double. So now, uh, last year it was 57. In 2020, I had um, put some slides together. It was at 37, and then the next week when I did the presentation, there were four more that I had to add, um, and that was within a week, so. And then as of 2022, so as of last Friday, um, there were 31 reported so far this year, and I guarantee you that will unfortunately continue to go up. And then as far as this data, um, trans people of color were at the most risk of um, violence, and the majority of, uh, the victims were trans women of color. And also this reported is the key word is important too because it's again more of that um, if people aren't out, they're not getting listed um, as a trans person uh, you know, being murdered. Uh, they may not feel safe coming out to police. Uh, their families might deny that they're trans so that's not um, recorded anywhere. Um, and trans people are also often uh, misgendered in the news uh, or in police reports. Um, okay, any questions about any of those stats? No. Yes? Yes, they are. I think it would be um, probably the same minus um, like the specifics about um, the race piece and things like that. Um, but there are some countries where it's still illegal to be queer. Um, you could be uh, arrested or put to death. Um, so there's some, some places that are not safe for people to vacation or to go to. Um, there's the UN's having some something this year, like a very large event, event and they picked a country in which um, it is illegal to be uh, LGBTQIA+. So there's a whole group of people that aren't able to go to this. Um, I think that they're um, trying to get them to change it now. but. And the reason, I, I would love to be able to uh, come out here and just talk about um, coming out and all of the best parts of that um, and not spread more uh, queer trauma in places where I would like to see uh, queer joy instead. 
Um, but I think it's also important for people to realize um, what it's like being LG LGBTQIA plus in this country because I think um, you know people will see like rainbow capitalism. You go to Target and you see the the rainbow T-shirts. Um, you know, people are having all of these pride events and then people say, well, you're fine because look, like this is your equality. You have a whole month, you have all of these parades, Target's selling rainbow things now, um, and they're missing out on the actual reality of it. So after all that, so why bother coming out? And then that, that is my, that's actually the one answer that I wanted to give and then I would have been, and then the presentation is complete because queer people deserve to exist and that's it. They're, we don't need any other reasons than that. Um, but if it's safe, it obviously allows people to live um, their lives as genuinely as possible, which is very important. Um, being visible helps normalize uh, LGBTQIA people. Uh, you know, you usually learn that we have always been here, and I have, you know, uh, data on that too. I can share some info. Um, it helps reduce stigma. It creates hope for queer folks who are not able to be out, uh, and it also humanizes us. And I put the little asterisk there um, because I want that to make people uncomfortable it's because one of the reasons why we have to be visible and put ourselves in harm's way is so that people realize that we're human beings and if it makes you uncomfortable then that's a good thing uh, that's the point and I invite you to kind of sit with that discomfort um, and then the last reason uh, societal change will impact all of those statistics so Coming out is, a, is you know, one of those things where it's obviously complicated um, and it should be uh, you know, a positive thing, but it's not always um, considered that way because of obviously all of the oppression and discrimination we face. Uh, there are also a lot of people who, you know, it's obviously very dangerous for them to come out. Um, so, it's good when you know people like myself can be um, visibly queer. I don't have a choice to be visibly queer. That's just how I look. But um, you know, I can be out. I can use my privilege to do things like this. So I know um, when I came here, when I came into this building, that I am going to be relatively safe. Like I'm going to come to this room. I'm going to speak. No one's going to harm me. Um, but when I am out of this room, when I am out in wherever, when I'm shopping in, like, I don't know, Target in my town, which is a, um, a town that is not LGBTQIA plus friendly, technically, um, I don't have the same privilege there than I do here. Because here, I am Emerson, and I'm here to talk to you about these things, and I have a PowerPoint, and there, I'm just kind of like a faceless person, and I'm different. So, um, so obviously there's risks to coming out. I've listed some of them here. Um, a lot of the people that I work with, I would say probably like 95% of my caseload are um, trans folks. And the first thing, they're, and they're all queer, which is, wonderful. Um, but the first thing that I do usually when someone says, okay, I'm ready to come out, I'm going to do it, uh, we safety plan. So even if you think that it's going to be a positive response, we still have, you know, we still have a conversation about, you know, if they respond this way, what is your plan? What can you do? Who are your contacts? Where can you go if you need to? Um, and then we kind of just, you know, sit back and hope for the best really. Um, and coming out is, it can be nerve wracking even when you think that there's going to be a positive outcome. Um, even when, you know, I'll have uh, sometimes kids whose parents are um, very supportive and they've talked about, um, 
you know, gender and sexuality to them before, and they have friends that are queer, and their parents are very, you know, that whole thing. Um, and it's still very nerve-wracking um, when it's your own, you know, family that you're kind of like putting yourself out there to, because even the fact that there is a, a risk of rejection, um, you know, can be really impactful for someone. And then outside of, you know, the risk of loss of community, connection, family support, there's also things like um, loss of jobs, um, houselessness, so losing your um, housing, your shelter. There are some laws in Massachusetts that protect from these, but they're not, um, I would say they're solid. Like we live in a nice little Massachusetts bubble, so we're probably the safest here than we c could be in probably any other state, maybe California is a little better. But, um, but we, are, we are all right here, but nothing's kind of like set in stone, which I think is the issue. So it's really a matter of, um, depends who's in office and who's putting bills through and who's advocating um, for you know, certain laws and things like this. Um, but as it stands right now, in Massachusetts, it is illegal to discriminate against someone for uh, housing and jobs based on their um, gender and sexuality. And that does cover uh, trans identities. In other states, it doesn't cover trans identities. It just covers your two binary um, genders that people think about when they think about that. Um, and there's also... Um, the fact that I think it was maybe two or three years ago that they uh, finally outlawed like conversion therapy for minors in Massachusetts. So that was not that was like 2019 maybe, um, and we're we weren't like the last state to do it. I think um, there's maybe 20 of them. So obviously all of the rest of them don't have that. Um, you know, don't have that law. And then, of course, at the bottom, coming out isn't a choice. Um, and that can be because, you know, you can be outed by someone. Just like, you know, the power and control wheel. It could be someone at work that does it. Um, or family members and things like that. And then coming out is healing. So coming out can be an opportunity to um, you know, live as your authentic self and find uh, connection and community. And this is, these are like best case scenarios, then all of these things would happen and people would live happily ever after. Um, so you can feel a sense of relief. You're giving yourself a chance to be um, accepted, a chance to uh, connect with other people, um, it can also be a path to kind of challenge some of your internalized um, homo negativity and trans negativity. Um, not being out can sometimes be a barrier to transition. Um, I've worked with folks before who um, they were adults, but not necessarily, it wasn't safe for them to come out in their home, um, and therefore they were not able to, they could have started um, medical transition because that was part of their transition goals, um, but they weren't able to until they were out and out of the home. So, um, and it can also obviously be empowering uh, when you come out to someone. Even if you don't get a good reaction, sometimes it's empowering, but definitely if it's a positive reaction. And this is basically talking about uh, visibility is important. Representation is very important. Um, visibility is also important. And it's improving, um, like things like queer talk, so queer TikTok, um, which is amazing. Even if people don't like TikTok, I highly recommend you know hopping on there. Um, celebrities that share pronouns or come out, so um, Elliot Page, 
um, came out a couple years ago as trans, um, and that started conversations, not always good conversations, but you know, dialogue nonetheless. Um, LGBTQIA plus friendly events, and I mean like local, more places will celebrate Pride Month, more small businesses, um, more people will have events like this one, which is helpful. Um, even rainbow capitalism, again, it's not the best thing, um, but it's helpful because it, again, introduces dialogue and things like that. And then there's more, I'm seeing more stories involving queer joy versus trauma as far as media. And I said that, and then tomorrow they're gonna announce like the worst movie about queer people uh, that they could have ever made, I'm sure. Um, but when I was younger, I'm in my late 30s. Um, when I was younger, my favorite movie, I came out when I was 15. My favorite movie about queer people was called Lost and Delirious. It is a horrible movie. Um, it's about uh, two teenage girls who fell in love, um, and then at the end, one dies, and one decides that she's actually straight, so she's gonna go back to her ex-boyfriend. So, um, and that was it. That was my representation, and that was my favorite movie, because that's all I had. Um, so it's a lot different as far as that now, which is good. Um, even in like kids television, there's definitely a lot of shows like um, She-Ra, yes, yes. <laughs> um, Steven Universe is another one. Owl House is amazing. Um, and it doesn't even have to be in the forefront. It's just the fact that they, so if, if you know the main character has a cousin that they saw once but their uh, parents are lesbians, then great. It doesn't have to be main character status. It just has to be normalized. And put it in there somewhere because we exist. Um, so things like that. And I also recommend Owl House if anyone has Disney Plus. Um, it's a very good show. Um, and then again, all of this is great, but we need more than visibility. We need advocacy, we need allies, acceptance, uh, social change, uh, things like that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about allyship and what that looks like. Anybody have any questions about any of these things? Okay, so allyship is something you do. It's not something that you can just say. Um, I would also, um, probably go so far as to say that if, if a queer person has not told you that you are an ally, then you are probably not an ally yet, which is fine. Um, but there's many people who kind of like take that um, title and they're not actually doing the work that we need them to. So, so these are just a few things that people can do. Um, being familiar with basic LGBTQIA plus terms and vocabulary, that's not knowing exactly everything that's just knowing what basic things are, just at least in LGBTQIA+, that, let's start there. Um, using affirming and inclusive language, and those two, that's like the bare minimum, that's why they're like starred. So if you can do that, that's a great start. Um, and then definitely consider some more of these things. Um, staying aware of queer issues and disparities, challenging varying forms of oppression, advocating for rights, uh, speaking up for but not over queer people. Um, being vocal about your support and using your privilege. Uh, if you are someone who is uh, a, you know, a cishet person, you have more privilege. This is the obvious piece. You have more privilege than uh, queer folks do, usually, not always. Um, and you can use that. So if you're in uh, a situation with someone, um, you can use your privilege to like, you know, stand up for queer rights. If you're in a room and people are talking about queer people in a derogatory manner, and you know that if you say something, you're not gonna be harmed, like you're safe, 
um, you can challenge some of that, and that is an example of using your privilege. So, accepting when you've done or said something problematic and taking steps to educate yourself um, versus getting um, like defensive or offending or offended. So basically just taking constructive feedback. Um, and then understanding impact versus intent. So just because you didn't mean for something to be offensive doesn't mean it wasn't offensive, even if you had a gay cousin and they're your favorite cousin. So. And then as you're doing some of this work, it's important for you to explore um, your biases and attitudes. So the ways to do this is to ask yourself, you know, what does it mean to me um, to be some of these things? So what does it mean to be gay? What does it mean to be trans? What does it mean to be bisexual? Um, and also exploring the messages that you were given as you were brought up. So how did your family talk about these things? How does your community? Um, because we have a tendency, because we're human, um, to internalize the messages that we're given or that are around us. And then they kind of just sit in the back of your head as maybe biases that you weren't aware of. Um, but that can be challenged just the same. And then how do I feel when I'm with someone who expresses a different sexual orientation or a gender identity. And then these are some examples of privilege relating to sexuality and gender. These don't apply to, all of them are not gonna to apply to people, right? So um, there are probably people, um, disabled folks who are not able to use the restroom in public, depending on what the restroom setup is. Um, there are many people who are not able to just pick a vacation spot anyway because they can't just pick a vacation. They can't be out of work. They can't have, um, you know, that lack of funding. They don't have the financial stability to do so. So just keeping those things in mind. Um, but being able to talk about your relationship freely. So if you're at work and you're able to say what you did over the weekend, um, you know, and talk about your spouse, your partner, uh, your family in that way, holding hands with your partner in public, uh, wearing certain clothing without fear of violence, um, knowing that your rights won't be voted away. This again, there's many people who, um, if you're a historically, if you're from part of a historically marginalized group in this country, then you are already politicized. Your body um, and your identity has already been politicized in some way. Um, and so many people, unfortunately, um, get their rights voted on. Um, again, being able to pick a spot to vacation, using the restroom in public, um, using your normal speaking voice without fear of violence. Um, when I am out in public, this is my voice. I'm not doing anything to it. This is just what it sounds like. Um, when I'm out in public and I uh, am interacting with someone, usually I am just another person until I talk. And then you see like the eyebrows and then people are staring and they're trying to figure out uh, things. And you can kind of see the gears working, um, you know. So there are some people who, because of that, they either don't talk um, or they'll try and kind of pitch their voice up or down so that they can just exist, because usually the goal is we just want to exist, and that's it. Um, knowing that you'll be safe at the doctor or the ER, um, that's a big one. And it's also, you know, going back to some of the disparities we talked about before, um, it's a big reason why some folks don't go to the doctor because they know that they're probably not going to be respected. Um, and when you're putting your life in someone else's hands, obviously you want to know that they're going to be unbiased and that you're going to be safe, and that's not always the case. Knowing that your relationship will not be questioned by anyone, um, being able to use your health insurance without gatekeeping is a big one. So. In Massachusetts, 
there are laws protecting um, trans people as far as insurances are supposed to cover gender-related care. And some of them do, some of them don't. So if you're getting um, insurance from an employer and your employer says we don't want to cover that, then you're just, that's it. You don't get it covered. Um, if you have like mass health and things like that, it's covered. But that doesn't mean that it's easy ever to do any of these things. So there's a lot of gatekeeping that comes with um, gender affirming care. Uh, there are a lot of hoops to jump through. There are, um, even if you're going through an informed consent clinic, which is just you go in, you sign a paperwork saying, yes, I'm an adult, I understand what you're going to do, and then you're supposed to be able to get the care. So even if you're going to a clinic like that, insurances can still ask for um, a letter from a mental health professional. Um, so you have to go to a mental health professional and have an assessment and have them write a letter saying, yes, you're trans um, or non-binary um, or whatever identity you hold, um, and that, yes, you are competent to make your own decisions. And then you take that letter, then you bring it to your doctor, and then you hope that the insurance approves it without you having to appeal a denial. So it's like a very long process. And also on the, on the letter piece, there's something called, um, it's the Gallup, G-A-L-A-P, maybe .org or .com, it's one of the two. Um, but it's basically a website of mental health professionals that have gotten together and they signed a pledge saying, I will see a person for free if they need a letter. Um, and I will try and do it in one session. Because the other thing that happens is you find a therapist. You don't really know if they're trans affirming because on psychology today, um, you don't need to prove that you are uh, queer affirming. You just need to check a box on your profile and that's it. And then you're queer affirming. Um, so you find a therapist. There may, they may or, not, may, may or may not be affirming. Then you're on their wait list then you see them. Then if they're not affirming, they say they need to see you a few more times to make sure that you are trans and that you know your identity and they'll have you come back. So sometimes I'll get people for letters um, and they have gone to therapists for months and then didn't end up getting a letter after everything. Um, so they, yeah, we, we write it, I do an assessment in one session and you leave with a letter and that's it. And then you're off to do whatever. Um, because it shouldn't be about proving your identity. It should be about just saying, like if you wanna make sure that someone's competent enough to make medical decisions for themselves, then okay. Um, but it shouldn't have to be all of this like song and dance. This is just on building inclusive spaces in classes. Um, so if anyone is interested in this piece, it's just some things you can do to make sure um, a space that you're occupying is um, affirming. It's pretty, most of it's pretty simple stuff. It's just so visibility. So have pictures of queer people somewhere or acknowledge that they exist. Put flags up if you would like. Um, you can, as far as in school, um, it's helpful if students can change their names on their IDs. I don't know how it works here. You can't, okay, good. Because <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> so I changed my name on like Right. But, um, well, not according to Microsoft. Yeah, not according to Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, so, so maybe some work to be done there. That's probably more about Microsoft. I get that. So maybe it's a matter of um, maybe it would be helpful to have like a new student pamphlet or something um, and list like all the things like, you know, that you can change your name and this is how you do it and you can make sure your ID says this. This is how you do it. You can't be under 40 uh, according to Microsoft. But um, yeah, so things like that are all really helpful. Um, also having a process for changing names on diplomas. Um, which people don't really think about, but oftentimes not everyone comes out when they're, yes? Mm -hmm. You can change it at any point. That's, it's a much easier process because they make their name tags in house. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, that's just, more, yeah, more barriers, really. And it's, it's difficult when you're starting a new job, you don't know what um, the climate is, really. You can guess, you can go on their website and look and see if they have like a human rights campaign does um, job ratings every year where they, um, will go down like a survey list and make sure that they have certain protections and certain things in their discrimination policies, and then they'll give them like a rating. Um, so like for like the big people, so Target should have one, like Bank of America, all the, like the big names usually have one. Um, but that also doesn't mean that they're, the, the branch or wherever you are working is going to be affirming. Um, so it's kind of difficult to gauge and it's, difficult when you have to be in there first and then you essentially do have to out yourself because you're like, all right, let's change this stuff and this is why. Um, so sometimes it makes it more complicated. Yes. Another interesting thing is mail because you know when, because you know uh, they'll send promotional stuff from BCC to your house. Since I don't use my actual name or anything, uh, but I have my name listed for BCC because I put it as a nickname. Mm -hmm. it, it will send stuff under my name to my house, which is a problem because it's like, who is this for? Yeah. Which I think it would be interesting if BCC had some sort of system where you could have names used in different instances. Mm -hmm. Because I know I have to use not my name on, on like legal forms like financial aid and yeah. stuff. Like I understand that, but at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I think too you can opt out of mail. Like I opted out of mail. I should yeah. probably do that just because mail. Yeah, is that's what I did with because my mom doesn't know, you know, so I don't want her being like just a. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I had to say. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think um, I always encourage people. I ca I call it so. Let's un under um, the title of advocacy and advocating for yourself. I always encourage people to poke at things like that. So ask why is there not like a thing? Why isn't there a separate uh, area that I can write this name and that name, especially in jobs too. I'll have a lot of people um, that'll say, oh, well, my um, my name is up on the schedule. So everyone will see. So the name tag will say whatever their name is and then the schedule will say their legal name. Um, and I always encourage them to poke because you don't need your legal name for much at a job, actually, you need it for your taxes, but that is also tied to your social security card. So technically, it doesn't really matter what name is on your W-2 or your W-10, whatever the form is. Um, so yeah, so I'd like to gently suggest poking people about that stuff. This is another way you can, uh, you know, be affirming is just be aware of some of these days. There are many of them. Um, Glad on their website has an extensive list. Um, that is a large book. Sorry. All right. And then affirming language. So this is just an example of some terms and how they've changed. Um, I did not put anything very offensive on here, um, and I would not anyway, because I, again, I don't think queer people need more trauma in their lives, and they don't need to see things like that, um, but these are kind of old, um, old terms versus new ones. So there's no ED at the end of transgender. Someone is not transgendered, they're just trans gender, um, uh, or, and also don't say a transgender or a homosexual, those are he. Um, chosen or preferred gender, now we just say affirm gender or just gender period. Usually when I talk about someone's name, I'm talking about their, their name, so the name that they use. So I don't say chosen or preferred name, I just say name and then I'll say um, legal name or if they use the term dead name, I will use that term. Um, FTM, F2M, and then MTF and M2F. Um, those are still used, and these are kind of, some of these terms are, if someone uses it to identify themselves, then that's fine, and I encourage you to use the language for people that they want you to use, um, but it's not so much like an umbrella thing. So now we say trans man and trans women, and they're two words because trans is an adjective, like tall or short. Um, Sex change surgery, we say gender affirmation surgery. Um, sexual preference is now sexual orientation. Um, and then pronouns are the same thing. So instead of preferred pronouns, you just say pronouns, because everyone has pronouns. Um, and then instead of saying sex or born as, you say sex assigned or assumed at birth. Um, and then again, at the bottom homosexual or ahomosexual, is gay, lesbian, et cetera, whatever term people use for themselves. And then here are examples of some bathroom signs. And you'll notice that there's just toilets on the signs and nothing, no like unicorns or dragons or like half skirted, half pant people. Um, Cause that, that's all you really need. <laughs> And then you'll see some of these say, well, urinals and stalls, um, and some just say stalls only, which is also helpful. And then it's just, the last one is a safe space sticker. This is again, like, um, bare minimum. And I also usually say to people, if you're putting up a safe space sticker, just make sure it's true. Um, Make sure you're putting in the work and you're challenging your biases and you're actually safe. Not that just you'll tolerate, uh, tolerate queer people because again, we don't need to be tolerated. We need acceptance, normalization, things like that. So, yeah. And then that's the end of my presentation so we can do questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.
or we can have a discussion about whatever. Yes. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, I have more points to add on to the fat phobia stuff because a lot of uh, for like trans mask uh, top surgery stuff, they'll re they'll uh, require you to be under a certain BMI in mm -hmm. order for surgery, and so some health class safety stuff I understand, but also sometimes they put that limit a little bit high, and also the expectation for top surgery and invasive surgery. It's also not the best for disabled people because a lot of people could not have uh, certain surgeries mm -hmm. because of whatever medical history they have, whether right. it be trauma, physical, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think another thing with that, too, is like um, even like binders, mm -hmm. like BCCD, um, it's like, I think, in my opinion, like the best known binder company, but they're not the best, which I, I bought some, they're expensive, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. they like, they like squished my chest, I couldn't breathe, they were the right size, they, but they were like, and then, I don't mean to get graphic, but like, it was kind of like falling, so I knew they like, were the right size, but they mm -hmm. just, they don't work with every body type, yeah. and I think that um, different binder companies, I mean, binders are difficult. I didn't even know binders existed when I was in like middle school, you yeah. know? So, um, yeah, I think different body types and different binders also kind of. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's shape shifters. I may have made that. I didn't make it up. Cool. Okay, yes. Yeah. They'll take all, you know, they take all of your measurements and then make it especially for you. Yeah, the downside is. And they're very expensive. Out. Yeah. If you're gonna order them, you gotta order them early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The thing about BCCD is that their sizes are very specific, and you need to make sure that you might you have to go with the largest size for whatever you need. For example, it's like all my other measurements met were one thing, but then like my shoulder size was a lot much larger than what they needed. So I went with the biggest possible one I could for that. Yeah. And another thing is that not all binder companies are made with trans people in mind. For example, Underworks was made to combat a gynecomastia or whatever it was in men. So it wasn't made with a trans body in mind. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing about the, you know, as far as BMI, um, and surgery and things like that. Um, it, it is very, I think most of them, I don't know, BMI is, a, is not obviously a helpful thing. Yes, exactly, yes, it's crap. Um, so I don't know the exact numbers, but I think that you know a lot of surgeons will want your BMI to be like 35, which is not, that's, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, or, and, you know, and that speaks, that's liability. They, they don't want to be liable for whatever happens because unfortunately they will br blame things um, on weight if they can. So, but. I mean, also, like, some of that does look just kind of being like ASAP. Like, mm -hmm. I've had a, um, I've had a wide range of issues throughout um, my life, but one of them in particular that I remember getting blamed on weight all the time. I'm an ASAP person. Um, I get horrendous cramps. Um, if I, like, I recently got on medication for it. And I was told for a long time, like, that's because you're weight light. It's because you're overweight light. It's just the whole thing. Um, turns out, um, I have a lot of testosterone for an ASAP person. And so um, I ended up going on to Spira, which is usually, um, it's, it's, it's a testosterone block. 
Mm -hmm. Usually it's a series of um, like uh, trans women who are transitioning, but like um, since I got on that, all of a sudden I'm like able to walk. <laughs> um, I'm like I'm on my period, and like that's something that like um, well partially due to the fact I'm overweight also had had a tie in with um, like a lot of I, I'm gonna say ASAP people because like. I identify as non-binary, but like, even if I didn't, like, I would be experiencing these problems. Like, doctors have a hard time believing, like, women having issues. Um, mm -hmm. And like, doctors can't believe patients know their body. They can. Um, yeah. Like, it, it's something I've noticed a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, um, I think, like, you were talking about doctors and how um, queer people are, like, well, yeah, I also like being a doctor, but um, I think, like, uh, we all know, like, it's way worse for people of color, mm. and, like, um, and so it's, like, we're experiencing as white people. If I'm experiencing all these problems with my doctor, you know, not getting a diagnosis that I need, et cetera, like it, you know it's like a hundred times worse mm -hmm. for people of color. It's just like it's bad. Yeah. Yeah. And the medical community has already not historically been good to people of color at all. So it's Yeah, there's actually a um, a health. It's actually this week, but there's a Fenway and Harvard um, put on a health conference every year, and it spans like over the course of a weekend, and it's for um, providers to come. So you can either be a medical provider or a mental health provider, and you go, and it's just focused on uh, trans health. Um, and I, it's actually been nice to see because I. I did it, this is probably like my fourth year doing it, and in the beginning, there were not a lot of people that attended, and now that has definitely changed. Um, so that's hopeful. Um, but I think that there needs to be more conversations like this, or about this, um, or even blaming things on um, like HRT. Um, like I had, I have high blood pressure, um, and I had it already, and then I had gone on HRT. I had already had high blood pressure for two years, and my doctor said, well, I think it's your, your HRT. And I said, no, it's not, because I, you know, and I showed them the thing. Um, but even if that was the case, um, cis men don't get put on testosterone blockers when they have high blood pressure. So I should not have to get off my testosterone to treat high blood pressure. Um, and it's more of like the same of things like that. There are a list of doctors uh, out there for trans individuals because trying to find my dose, I had to go through like five different trans people to get a solid answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know Dr. Kishore Lakshman in PPE who operates out of Boston in Fall River. Mm -hmm. He's one of the paper ones who doesn't require uh, a note, mm -hmm. but it is still insanely hard to get into seasons. Uh, yeah. If the school could provide a list of just, hey, these are a few affirming doctors that are willing to work with whoever. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, um, there's a, like a resource section um, on my website, which I will share. That's, you know, um, and there's a medical section, and there are a few doctors there. But it's, you know, it's difficult too, because so like Fenway is, Good. They're an LGBT affirming clinic, and which is great. And you know that the people coming in, that your providers are having, you know, training on being affirmative and things like that. However, their turnover is very high, as it is in 
uh, usually in like community health centers, the turnover is very high. Um, so you'll have people who are, you know, have seen a doctor for a year and every year they're getting a new doctor, um, which is also not fair. Um, and there's also Thundermist in Rhode Island is more of the same, um, but that, that's another one. Um, but yeah, endos are tough because most of the ones that I've run into do want letters because their specialty is not HRT. So they're, yeah, they're requiring letters for hormones and things like that. Mm-hmm. It's the same as that. Yeah. Awful. You can get it waived, but it's hit or miss as to judge whether or not they yeah. want to let you. Mm-hmm. I don't know why that it needs to be in the newspaper. I think it's because they don't, they think about it first. There's people getting their name changed, so they want to make sure that they don't use it for fraud purposes. No, yeah. I think um, something too, like, I was like, is it because they're like, if it's like, Yeah. It, it seems very, very I think they're just being really overprotective because it's, it's like, you've already looked at me. You know I'm not going to commit a crime by changing my name. Uh, one of the better things now is most of it's online now, finally. Uh, last year, I think it was, it, it wasn't online. Mm-hmm. And with COVID, you couldn't see it, really. Yeah. Forever. Yeah, now is probably the best time if you actually if you have the funds because it is expensive and then putting your name in the paper is also exp- that's an added expense um, but you can also file to have the fees waived which is like I think it's like another motion so it's more paperwork um, but now is probably the best time to get a name change because it is online so you can go and you know, put everything online. Um, you can file a motion for a waiver um, to have it published. And if anyone needs that, you email me and I'll send you a, like a, an example. Um, and they can approve it and you can get your name change paperwork before you even, you know, I had changed my name uh, earlier this year and then I filed everything and then waited and I was like all right well they're going to tell me at some point and then a week later I had my paper in the mail saying congratulations which was nice Um, but now is probably the best time you don't have to go in you don't have to um, which is a whole nother process because you have to present yourself to a judge and then you have to explain why you want to get your name changed and there's a bunch of people or it's just uh, it's very it's unnecessarily nerve-wracking really so while they have it online I would suggest, or maybe they might keep that, which would be great, but, yeah. Yes? I think something interesting to talk about is the way the pandemic uh, changed the way that a lot of this stuff is talked about, because I know a lot of people, like either people I went to school with or friends or whatever, that came out during the pandemic because they spent so much time at home. Mm-hmm. I think it's interesting to analyze that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely it had I you know, being stuck at home without the ability to go anywhere or, you know, engage in any hobbies or community really. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of uh self reflection that people did. I found a lot of people that um contacted me because they they were like well I the pandemic happened and then I realized I was trans okay like that's great (laughs) you know so um, I think it's pretty common and it also um, it impacted I mean everyone knows that it impacted a lot of people's mental health but it has the um, 
this additional piece for um, queer people, like safety in the home, right? They weren't necessarily safe to begin with. I think um, something like 22% of um, college students uh, chose a college away from home to be safe, like to get away from um, a family that maybe was not supportive or affirming. Um, those were queer college students. Um, and yeah, and also like separation from your community. So I, and I think community for queer people is huge. And it's basically, it's what the whole culture is based on, like the idea of chosen family and finding people um, that accept you for who you are and things like that. So it was difficult. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just, I don't know. Like, for me, it was just realizing like there isn't a wrong way to present, and you just present what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. Like that, that was kind of my big thing. Oh, absolutely. You don't have to fit any sort of box or stereotype. Yeah. So when people say that gender is not a social construct, that's definitely <laughs> right. Yeah. It's uh, you're definitely affected by I think. Uh, heteronormative and cisnormative culture and you don't even realize it um, so until you're separated from it. I even see it in my job. Um, I, I do customer service. So like my, my voice kind of sits a little low, you know, full testosterone disorder thing and everything. And I've noticed especially recently that like I pitch up my voice in uh, social standing. So like I'm not doing it now. Usually my voice sits about here though. Like this is how I talk to people in person. And when I pick up the phone, it goes up higher. Um, like, I ask, I work at BJ's, so I answer the phone, like, hi, thank you for calling the town BJ's. And it sits here the entire call. Mm -hmm. And I've had to 
somebody asked me about that, and I'm like, I, I think it's just like, I have this like nervous reaction to like, of like, I need to like present this certain way. Mm -hmm. And how that's manifested is just how high my voice is. And it's, oh, yeah. like, I heard her on the phone talking to my dad. She, she was driving to school every day. And I heard her on the phone talking to my dad, um, telling him, being like, uh, I just, like, all this stuff. And I think the pandemic really sucked because I was kind of, like, I've never let go of that. And, like, I was in this house still in the house, but now I have a car. I have the EPC I can go to. to get over. It's like when I came out, my, I, my mom would clean me out and said I didn't fully heal. Still won't get over that, but it, it just takes time. You eventually either live with it or move on. <laughs> yeah. I think um, the pandemic sucks because we're stuck with birth. And then it, I don't mean to be like doing like a trap no. dump. At some point, she was mad at her boyfriend, so she kicked me and my sister out of the house for like a weekend. And that's my cousin over there. She stayed at my cousin's house. <laughs> it was funny, but um, so the pandemic sucked. <laughs> yeah, I think it it unfortunately trapped a lot of people in situations that you know, when, when school or being out of the house or working anything, right, is a refuge and you don't have that, um, you know, it's really difficult. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, there's this, so when I was younger, it, it was not like this. Being queer, first of all, you didn't say queer. That wasn't a thing. They had just switched the L and the G in, in LGBT. It used to be GLBT and then women's rights um, movement. And then they said, no, we're putting the L first. And that, hap that happened in like the 70s or 80s, I believe. So the, the letters weren't the same, the combination. Um, and coming out then was much different than it, it seemed. And I, you know, I am not um, a younger person to know what it's like to come out in middle school now or in high school now. Um, but it seems like just this, um, like the whole culture of um, social media. And usually I curse social media because it's, definitely not helpful a lot, um, but it has such a, an important part to play in like connecting people and helping people build community and, um, you know, where someone who um, would be struggling with their sexuality or their gender, you can go online and go to queer TikTok um, and learn about all of these things and go, oh, like, and, you know, and have it really resonate with them. Um, yeah, sorry, the beetle just distracted me. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think that's a really important thing. And if anything, um, the pandemic, I think, made that easier. Like that ability to connect, probably because there was no other choice, really. Like there's only so many ways you can connect with people. Um, but yeah.
queer identity from Tumblr. So it's like, I think it's been very helpful, but I think it's harmful in a lot of other ways. Like, when I, I'll be on my TikTok and people are like, oh, help, I got on the wrong side of TikTok, and now there's all these people, you know, calling me slurs forever. Yeah. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting to see how kind of things. I have siblings that are all over the spectrum when it comes to LGBT, and uh, it is great to see my little sibling have the ability to just be open however she wants. Mm-hmm. Whereas growing up, you know, I'm 25, and even in high school, it wasn't something we talked about. Okay. And just people who knew knew, and that was it. You didn't talk about it. It's now nice to see. While social media to me is a problem in its own zone, it is nice to see that the kids have a safe place to just be themselves. Mm -hmm. It's great to see. Yeah. Um, I'm only like, I'm 20, so I'm not that much younger than you, but um, (coughs) like when I was in school, like we had a functioning GSA, like it wasn't like social ostracization if someone came out kind of deal, but like it was kind of like, oh, you know, like that's neat. Whatever. Um, there was kind of uh, this interesting little like bubble, I would say. Um, there was a couple of kids who went to my school who like wanted to be influencers, some more successful than others, who um, like they had that stigma. <laughs> if that makes sense, like um, one of them was um, like um, it's this kid in the grade uh, who was in the grade uh, below me. He um, got like decently popular doing uh, makeup brand deals. Like, um, so seeing that, like, pe- like, it, I went to high school post like James Charles coming to fame. Like, people were kind of like, eh, you know, like, it, whatever. But that was a more divisive thing than like a trans kid. Or um, I think it was, it was kind of interesting to to like see. Um, so-and-so's gay. I don't care. Did you see what Cameron posted? Like, that was more of, like, a thing. Mm-hmm. So, I, like, I, I will say times are a-changing. Yeah, it's, it's great to see, actually. Yeah. 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 I'm going to leave Fred and I exam, but I'm just going to say that uh, I'm 19, and we, uh, when I was in middle school, that was, like, the Caitlyn Jenner era, like, when she came out. And considering the hostility she has had and people have had towards her. I find it interesting that new people are approaching as role models like Elliot Page, as you've mentioned earlier, because they're much uh, much more friendly to the community compared yeah. to the era that I grew up, which is funny because we all talk about very varying uh, experiences even when a lot of us grew up with a lot of overlap in age ranges. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I close my eyes. Have fun. Have fun. I'll definitely have fun. <laughs> I hope they don't put eye drops in my eyes. They probably will, but it's okay. If they ask every letter of E. Every letter of E. For I. percent of people fell on the quiet spectrum and then you had the one or two kids that were that ruined not, yep. that real bad.
is like the fan base I'm talking about, people were more like, that kid sucks, more than like they cared about anyone being like gay or trans, which I thought was really interesting. I went to an agricultural high school for Salagi. So oh. maybe people didn't exist. <laughs> them pronouns as like a singular pronoun because he was like, well, it's for multiple people and blah, blah, blah. You have to say he and or she. And the only like alternative pronoun he would accept was like he or zer, which is like people go by that, but I feel like I've met more people who use they, them, mm -hmm. but he wouldn't accept that. Um, so it was very, like I didn't use they, them in high school, but like one of my best friends did, and they experienced so much like anger and upsetness, I don't know, being mm -hmm. upset, but it, I didn't, that's like valid, it, it was kind of BS mm -hmm. that it was a predominantly queer school, but the, like, the head of the school um, wasn't It's also unfortunate that one person has that much pull to kind of like, uh, you know, affect that change across an entire school campus. But, but so singular they has been in use for longer than singular you. So hundreds of years. Okay. I just want to, I want to debunk that if anyone, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. He literally right. went to Harvard Law, and you can't let, like, I know he's a smart guy, you know, but you can't let people use singular, that it's not like it's not in use, he was like, well, these are the rules, and the problem I have with that is that we control language, you know, we make language, mm -hmm. that's why slang exists, that's why buzzwords exist, that's why we have things like me. You know, we control language. Hey, what are the kids saying these days? Yeah. Well, I don't know. None of us know that. The boys. But the problem was the like college essays, because he he wanted to he wouldn't respect people's pronouns because of college essays because he said you have to use he and or she when instead of there for like plural on formal writing. They're even changing though, that anyway. Even though the conversation, yeah, you know, people do it all the time and still think about it, and then it's like, well, mm -hmm. think about it more. <laughs> you already do this. Yeah. And then right. to, to, um, one of my friend's moms is like struggling with like the concept of like, what do you mean they use? 
simple to use singular day. That's not possible. I'm like, you just said it. Or like, you know, someone like your kid's friend left a coat behind. Tell your friend they left their coat. Like, you use that conversationally. It's as soon as someone points out that that is their preferred way of being referred to, they Google problem. Like, so what's so the last thing that you use really? they more than you use he or she? Because if it's not they, I find myself using people's names more than anything else. Yeah. Mm. Jimmy's coat. Jimmy left their coat behind. Like, yeah. Romans, the Greeks, the Vikings, so on and so forth. Yeah. The earliest, um, the earliest record of LGBTQIA people existing was 9,000 BC on rock paintings, cave paintings. The earliest record of um, trans people existing was 7,000 BC, which was, again, like, you know, through art and things like that. The first gender... Um, Affirming surgery was in 1906 in Europe. Um, in 1919, uh, there was a trans clinic that was um, created in Germany and then destroyed. Uh, Magda, yeah, yeah. And then destroyed by um, Nazis, unfortunately. And then uh, in, in the 70s, we just acted like, I don't know, what is this trans thing? I have no idea. this girlfriend and everyone knew but like I remember distinctly my sister coming into my room unprompted and saying oh you know our lesbian aunt not lesbian aunt but like you know our aunt and her friend and I was like oh I thought they were like dating like it was no big deal and my sister like insisted to me that they were just friends like it's I, I was a kid like I knew they were together it wasn't like some big deal 
it, and I didn't have a problem with it, but my parents did, you know, and I think that was a result of being from Missy and I grew up in. Like, that was part of it. Yeah. Now it's easier because now I have a girlfriend. I can be like my girlfriend instead of just saying like all day, like in front of my, you know. So I think like learning with that. Um, but yeah, that's like just the thing you know, to do. Uh, are you a fan of podcasts? Um, yes, I like podcasts. 
one of the best and most helpful podcasts I found was Gender Reveal by Punk Woodstock. He interviews uh, a bunch of LGBT activists, artists, people in the community to explain gender and identity as a whole. And it was one of uh, one of the things I've taken the most from it is if you ask yourself a question, no cis straight heteronormal person has to sit there and question something. If someone says, hey, what's your gender, and you think about it for a minute, there's something there to explore. Mm -hmm. You should take the moment to just go with it and see where you go. And uh, that check it out. It's actually very helpful. It helps so me through a lot. Uh, talk with stock. Uh, just gender reveals on Spotify. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's accurate. <laughs> there's there's not you, usually if you're you know questioning something, there's even if nothing comes of it, then yeah. sure, just explore and kind of see. But um, yeah, usually that's one of the the tip offs, and that's why it's so important to. I mean, aside from the visibility piece, but I love that um, middle schools are having well. Not all of them, but some yeah. of them have more discourse about these things, and I think that's great. And if elementary schools could do it, that would be amazing, maybe someday. Um, but then, you know, in that case, like arming someone with that language is the important piece, right? Because maybe they're not getting it at home. Like I grew up, my mom is from Portugal, so I'm a first generation American on her side, and my uh, dad was uh, Cape Verdean and Lebanese. So, um, we were not talking about gay people. And I had a gay uncle and we didn't kind of, you know, like he would come over and with his boyfriend and we'd be like, they exist and no one would say the word gay. I didn't even hear it until I was like 10. So um, having that language is really important or just knowing that, you know, humans exist this way as well, you know, but yeah. So we've got 